Well, thank you all for coming. As a VJ, thank you for that great introduction as well. It's a real pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And as VJ said, I'm a neuroscientist. And what I'd like to share with you today is a vision of how some animals are able to do imaginary and fantastic things with their brains that you and I cannot. All of these animals that are pictured in this slide have evolved an ability to detect parameters about the Earth that you and I cannot do. And they do it very effectively for specific purposes. They use it in order to determine their spatial location, their heading direction, and their navigational goal endpoint. I call it the sense of mystery. Why is it mysterious? Because we have no clue how they actually do this. We don't know how they perceive it, we don't know how they process it, and we don't know the endpoint goal of the navigation mechanism. But I can promise you, they are very good at it. And without this sense of ability, they would be clueless and lost. What is the sense I'm talking about? It's the detection of the Earth's magnetic field. We call it magnetoreception. And all of these animals have the capability of it doing exactly that. From birds in northern Scandinavia that migrate across the Mediterranean into Africa, to sea turtles that live for two years before they come back to their nesting grounds, to honeybees that basically fly from their nest across a magnetic line, forage for the day, turn around, and fly back. To bats live in North Pat in the United States that use the magnetic field for their foraging at night. How do they do this? Well, as I mentioned, humans don't have this ability. We cannot detect the Earth's magnetic field in any way or form that we know about. It. But I'll come to that point later in the talk. Here's a famous human who's extremely gifted in science and physics and math. Albert Einstein shares a passion with me, he likes to sail. And this is a picture of Albert Einstein in the late 30s up in the Finger Lakes of New York. Although Albert was quite brilliant at mathematics, he's actually a very poor navigator, as most humans are. And in fact, reports are that he would quite often get lost in a sailboat, run aground, and have people try to come out and get him. Not a great navigator, a brilliant mathematician. However, the little black cap, as pictured on the side, is both a great navigator, because they go from Scandinavia across the Mediterranean into Africa, and they perform some very sophisticated mathematics. The mathematics that we pictured here is actually a formula that the brain uses a lot to solve many complicated problems in perception. It's called Bayesian inference theory, and it's really a probabilistic statistics function that takes cues and weights them according to their reliability. How reliable are the cues in order to get pathfind to my end goal? In this case, I've used the equation, the Bayesian inference, to take three different cues that an animal could use for navigation purposes. The first is the magnetic reception. The other is visual velocity as they're flying through space. And the third is the vestibular system, which actually detects motion and acceleration relative to gravity, and then passes that information on into the brain. You combine these three reliability cues, and you come up with the animal's heading direction. Is this how the brain actually does it? We're not sure, but we're performing recordings in different brain regions to try to answer that very question. So the birds are really good at two different things. They're great navigators, and they're great mathematicians. So the next time someone calls you bird brain, take it as a compliment. Now, what is it about the Earth's magnetic field that could actually be used for purposes of navigation and positioning? Well, let's take a look at what the magnetic field actually consists of. The Earth is actually just a very large bar magnet. And how it's generated is still debated among geophysicists today. But what we can see is that there are magnetic field lines, if you look to the left side of the Earth, that exit the Earth at the magnetic south pole, circle the Earth, and enter the Earth at the north magnetic pole. And there's a polarity to them. They're positive in the southern hemisphere, and they're negative in the positive, oh, sorry, the northern hemisphere. So in a sense, you can divide the Earth into two hemispheres, a positive region and a negative region. You can also notice that the field lines exit the south magnetic pole almost perpendicular to the Earth's surface. They come out at an inclination angle of around 90 degrees. However, the field lines that come out close to the equator actually have a parallel course to the surface of the Earth. So they have a zero degree inclination angle. And that difference between zero degrees and 90 degrees systematically varies as you travel across latitude across the planet. 
Now, to give you a point of reference, Houston, Texas, we have an inclination angle of around 42 degrees. There's a second property that's important. Over on the right of the globe, you can see that the field lines have a magnitude associated with them. It's called an intensity. This intensity also systematically varies. It's highest at the poles, and it's lowest at the equator. And to give you an idea of what the magnitude is metrically, we measure magnetic fields in a term called gauss. So at the lowest level near the equator, the magnetic field is around 0.2 gauss, whereas at the poles, it's around 0.7 gauss. And we'll come back to this point a little bit later. Talk. Again, for reference, the gauss level at Houston, Texas is about 0.5. Now, knowing these properties of the Earth's magnetic field, if one was to go in and look in the animals now to see how they might actually detect and process magnetic information, one has to go to the laboratory. And in building a laboratory to study the Earth's magnetic field, we had to start from scratch. So first we built a room that was shielded like an MRI facility that would cancel out the stray magnetic lines that would be coming into the room. Then we built a motion platform, which I won't be talking about today. But on top of it, we made a cube and this cube had field coils buried inside so that we could generate a magnetic field in any direction, intensity that we wished. And we then chose an animal model, pigeons. We chose pigeons because they're extremely smart and they're fantastic navigators. Pigeons have been used for thousands of years, even by the Egyptian and Roman soldiers, to track their way back home and carry news of the battles back to the king. They're very good home. You can take a pigeon today to an unknown location they've never seen before, and within hours or days, they can fly back home. So we placed pigeons inside our magnetic field generator, and we had to keep them in the dark, and we padded their bodies and made them so they couldn't move around well because we wanted the only stimulus that was being presented to them, the magnetic field. We can't see magnetic fields as humans, so we had to take a magnetometer chip and put it below the animal's head in order to measure the field, and then use a very sophisticated computer algorithm that we made to cancel the natural field that was existing in the box, and then generate our own field in any direction and intensity that we wished. On the right, can you go ahead and play the video, is my a uh, postdoc cell phone that was placed in the magnetic field. And if you watch, as we turn the magnetic field on, you'll see that the direction of the magnetic field changes first in a clockwise direction, or excuse me, counterclockwise, and then in a clockwise direction. And we can do this in any plane that we wish, relative to the end. Now, our first line of inquiry was, well, do all cells in the brain respond to the Earth's magnetic field? Or are there just pieces? Are there just regions within the brain that have specialized sens sensations for the magnetic field detection? And we used a little bit of molecular engineering to answer that question. Today, there is a protein that's released from the cell nucleus. They're called immediate early release genes at the time that brain cells are activated for tens of minutes. Then they get into the cytoplasm, and we've developed antibodies to find those particular proteins and attached fluorescent particles or uh, markers that can be looked at under the microscope. So we took pigeons and we placed them in our magnetic field generator and stimulated them with a direct magnetic field for about an hour. Then we took them out, kept the brains, and sliced the brains and looked for the magnetic neural activation marker. And what you can see by the section that's located on the bottom right, there are regions that are specifically activated. Each of the blue dots was a cell that was activated by magnetic field stimulation. And they're not homogeneous throughout the brain. In fact, they're regionally compartmentalized. If you look on the section on the bottom right, this is an area called the vestibular nuclei, which receives information about motion through space, and it lies next to the spinal cord, so it's in the back part, bottom of the brain. Whereas on the top left is a region of the brain that's associated with the front of the brain close to the beak. Other than the vestibular nuclei, again in that bottom right section, if you look in the bottom left section, there is a region in the middle brain called the anterior thalamus, where we know from animal studies, mostly in mice, that many of these cells respond to heading direction of the animal as he moves through the environment. So it's interesting that we found magnetic sensitivity in that same place. Just above it, labeled HP, is an area you've probably heard about. It's called the hippocampus. And we know in human studies, as well as many animal studies, that the hippocampus 
is highly involved in spatial memory and spatial location. And then finally, the top two sections on the left show a region of cortex that receives multisensory information from the visual system, the vestibular system, and the trigeminal system. And we know from other animal studies that these cells are involved in, in perception of motion through space. So what we have is a neural pathway for magnetic reception in the brain of the bird. And now we can selectively go in and look at each of these processing stations to see how the cells encode different parameters of the Earth's magnetic field. Oh, can we play this video? So what we did is we took fine wire electrodes and we started the vestibular nuclei, which is a very uh, familiar place for us to record. And in the top, what you see are the electrical discharges that come from a single brain cell as it's talking in a language of firing pattern, we say, action potentials that are being generated and passed on to the next neuron. And when you play that through a loudspeaker, you hear these popping noises. These popping noises are actually the electrical discharge that are being passed on as information sequences to the next brain region. It's the language of communication that the brain uses to talk. You'll also notice on the bottom that this is the magnetic field as it's spinning around the animal, and the red arrow indicates the direction as we're in different planes. Can we play it one more time? Now listen, and you'll hear the neuron increase and decrease its activity proportional to where the red arrow is pointing, in this case, down and to the left. Now that kind of discharge rate is the first thing that when you send a graduate student into an electrophysiology lab and they hear the language of the brain, their eyes just light up. And that's how we hook them into becoming neuroscience. So this is the first thing that I do on day one of graduate. Now from those responses, we can take them all from the different planes that you saw rotating. We can take all those magnetic responses and we can put them in a large matrix and then fit it with a mathematical function. And the function that it turns fits best to those magnetic parameters response is a three-dimensional cosine function. And that has specific properties associated with it about telling us what the information is. If you look across all the cells we recorded, what you find is that each cell has a different direction in magnetic space that it likes. They actually encode that inclination angle that I was telling you. There are some cells that respond best to the angle at Houston, there's some cells that respond best to the angle at the equator, and there's cells that respond best to all places in between up to the pole. It's a map of inclination magnetic space, and it's in your brain. The other thing we did was look about intensity. We varied the intensity at shown on the left to 0.2, which is the lowest intensity that you can find on Earth to about three times Earth strength, which is the last dot on the right, and I'm just showing you three cells and their responses. At 0.2, the neurons don't respond with very high firing rate. At 0.5, as the cell is in Houston, it's accelerated in its firing rate, but double that or trip that, triple that, there was a saturation phenomenon, meaning that the cell didn't respond anymore. All right? And why is this important is because that's exactly the range that animals would have to evolve in in order to be biologically active within the Earth's magnetic field. If they only responded to high strength magnetic fields, it would be useless to them. They have to respond in the Earth's strength, and they do. Okay, back to the mystery. Where is the magnetic transduction mechanism? How is this actually done? Well, there are three theories. The first is that there are photopigments in the eye. And these photopigments in the eyes are called cryptochromes. And in a blue wavelength of light, the cryptochromes have molecules with spin rates that can be aligned, just much, very similar to the way an MRI works on water molecules. And those alignments could be transduced into neural signals and transferred to the brain. But this is all theory. No one has physiologically identified that yet. There were some studies a while back in the 70s that found iron particles in the beaks of pigeons and in other birds as well. And it was proposed that these iron particles could serve as a magnetic source. But as of today, no one has been able to physiologically show that. The third theory is the one we're pursuing. That in the vestibular system, in your inner ear, 
there are receptors that detect acceleration and head movements relative to gravity. But amphibians, reptiles, fish, and birds have three of these receptor types, whereas all mammals that we know about have two. The third one is called the lagina. And since there's a special organ in the ear, and we recorded from vestibular neurons in the brainstem that detect the Earth's magnetic field, we thought, is it possible that the lagina is the receptor? So we looked, we took laginas out of birds, we went to the Argonne National Facility south of Chicago, which is a high energy photon source, meaning large x-rays, and you can put your tissues in the beam line. We did that with the lagina, and then you can look for isotopes or any element in the periodic table selectively. So we chose magnesium, copper, iron, other particles like that, zinc, that could have magnetic properties, and what I'm showing you here by the red arrows is a cross-section of that Lagina receptor where iron is indicated in red and the lack of iron is indicated in blue. And what you see is there's a concentration of iron particles specifically in certain regions of the epithelium. And not only that, the analysis that we performed showed us that these iron particles are actually Fe3O4, a form of biogenic magnetite with permanent magnetic characteristics. So there's these clusters of magnetic crystals that exist in this receptor epithelium. Could it be that this is the transduction mechanism? We don't know yet, but we're isolating these cells to try to figure that out. So I'd like to leave you today with first a quote and then a posit. Dan Wolpert, another very famous neuroscientist who studies movement, has said in a series of papers that the brain evolved to do one thing and one thing only and that is control movement. All of your behavior goes down to movement, love, sex, everything, it's all about movement. But I give you this posit. There's another thing that the human brain does. It evolves to survive in ways that nature didn't give us control over. And here's why I say it. You don't have the ability to detect the Earth's magnetic field in your brain, but through science, and technology applied, we develop the ability to detect the Earth's magnetic field, combine it with acceleration and satellite information to create a navigational system that all of us carry in our smartphones in our pocket. So through the evolution using our brain, we provide capacities that we don't have otherwise. And I can only hope what the future will bring in that regard.